in chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14. He says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. we look at this passage this morning, we're going to look at the fact that you are the object of God's divine love, both in time and throughout all eternity. You are the object of God's divine love, not only in time while we live here on this earth, but for all eternity as well. The songwriter captured it with these words. He says, O love of God is greater still than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest stars, it reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bow down with care, God gave his son to win. His erring child to reconcile and pardon from all sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and, and were the sky a parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe, a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, that would stretch from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints' and angels' song. We can't fully comprehend God's love. And yet that love is demonstrated to us in a very open way the writer of that song tells us that even though the whole ocean was filled with ink and every person on earth would be a scribe, to write the love of God would drain the ocean. We don't fully comprehend, we don't fully know that great love that God has for us. We know that that love has been demonstrated to us in the person of Christ. And in the person of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Paul writes, The love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. First John, John writes these words, And this was manifest the love of God be be, and this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live or have life through him. Because the purpose of Christ's coming, the manifestation of God's love, was his sending his only begotten Son into the world, that we would have life through him. That life was desperately needed because the Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and sin. We looked forward to a physical death, and if not receiving him as our Savior, we would experience eternal separation from him, eternal death. And yet he came to offer us a life. Not only life, spiritual life, a new relationship with himself, being born into his family, but we have a love that we cannot fully understand. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
John records this in the book of Revelation. Unto him that loved us, unto him that loved us, and washed us in his own, and washed us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1 5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And as we look at this passage of scripture, we see that there is a love, a divine love that God has imparted unto us. And really in, in, in this book, we see that Paul writes this section to encourage the faint-hearted believers. Appropriately, they were going through difficulty and they needed this word of encouragement. The difficulties and sufferings that they had found themselves in. And here he reassures not only their relationship with God, but the fact that they are loved with an everlasting love. The reminder that they are the object of God's abiding love. The idea there is that God's love abides upon us. It is an abiding love. And here he reminds these believers that they are the object of God's abiding love and the fact that God has a work, that God is at work in their life. God is at work in our life as well. Well, Paul says, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Christ. And many times those are the very two facts that we lose sight of when we become believer or when we go through difficulties. We forget that God loves us with an everlasting love. We forget that God is continually doing a work within us. The very first thing many times people question is, especially when going through difficulty or tragedy, if God loved me, why is this happening in my life? How could God be demonstrating his love to me, and yet my world seems to be falling apart? Tragedy, suffering, adversity, whatever we may be going through in life, is a question that many people ask. And then the second question that many people ask is, where is God? And yet God is always in the same place. He's never moved. It is God who is still working in our life to accomplish uh, those things which he desires in us. And really, someone has settled it, and I remember reading the, uh, the, the, uh, the study of uh, Blackaby, and in and, and talking about the fact of him questioning the love of God when his daughter had cancer. And he said, you know what, the thing that brought him to a realization of God's love was the cross. That you know what, that is a, a question that is forever settled, or should be forever settled in the heart and mind of every believer. It doesn't matter if we go through difficulties, it doesn't matter if we go through hard times, we are still the objects of God's everlasting love. And that love is demonstrated by the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That we are now a part of his family. We've been adopted into his family as sons and daughters. We will be with him for all eternity. And see, Paul writes here that we are the object of God's love. Not only are we the object of God's love, but that God is doing a work within each one of us. He is working in us to conform us to the image of Christ. He is working in us to change and transform our life. And so, in spite of all the difficulties that we might face in life, we see that God is still at work. Many times people question that during the dark, dark times of their life. And yet we're reminded of the psalmist David, who said, you know what, the Lord is my shepherd. And the Lord being my shepherd will always be there present with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down be, be, uh, beside uh, still waters, green pastures and still waters. And then he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
the difficult points of life. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He says, Thou prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's exactly what Paul is telling us here, that God began a good work in us, and that good work will be completed when we stand in the presence of God with a new glorified body. And so God is not going to let us fall through the cracks. He's not going to let us go. We are part of his family. Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He says, my father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. There's a security. We are in the father's hand. The destiny, the place that we are going through is secure. The place that we will end up is eternity with God in the very presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that he mentions here, not only would God be with them in time throughout all of life, but that he would be with them for all eternity. That love would be an endless, everlasting love. In time, he has brought them to salvation, and really that is what brought about the difficulties in their life. It is the fact that they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they lived in a pagan society, and all of a sudden there they underwent as a church a, a marvelous and miraculous change in their life, now, not only they became the, uh, the focus of their enemies, those that opposed the gospel, but they became the focus of the adversary himself, which is the devil. They had gone through these various trials in their life. By the time we get to the second epistle of Thessalonians, we see that they had already, they were thinking that they were already in the great tribulation because of all the persecution and opposition that they were growing, going through. And yet Paul assures them that that was still a future event and that God was with them in the present. And so we see that God is with us in the present. In time, he has brought us salvation. Someone has said, men may hate and persecute them but they can't take, uh, take, uh, take the courage from them, the fact that the object, that they are still the object of God's love. They are to take courage in the fact that they are still the object of God's love. And really, that is the same thing that each one of us must consider when going through difficulties, that we are the object of God's love. Not questioning, does God still love us, but realizing that no matter what happens to us in the life, in life, that we are the object of God's love. <clears throat> Our future is secure. He has promised to be with us all the days of our life. He has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He has promised to be with us, to guide us, help us. He sent his comforter. He says, I'm going to send the comforter that he may abide with you forever, that he may be your helper throughout all of life. And so we have God, his presence. We have God's unfailing love. And in the end, God will triumph over all evil. We see this in this passage. Paul writes of the fact that God will triumph over evil not only the evil one, but all evil that exists. And so we are a part of the team that is victorious. Our faith is resting in the everlasting and eternal God, the one who cares for us. Let's look at a couple of points in this uh, passage of scripture. 
First of all, that God's love is displayed in eternity past. God's love is displayed in eternity past. Notice what he says here in verse 16. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. That God has chosen you from the very beginning to salvation. How did he do it? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. That love is displayed in eternity past. Someone said the engineering of man's, man's salvation lies in God's hands. It is set forth, it is set forth a salvation that reaches from eternity past into eternity future. Notice what he says in the next verse. He says, Where, wherein he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of our to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There we have eternity past, and then we have eternity future. Eternity future that we may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Still a future event. And so he sets forth and he gives us the picture of salvation, not only reaching into the past, but reaching into the future as well. Paul writes these words in Romans chapter 8. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. Whom he called, then he also justified. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. And so we see that God has a here. He gives us the full scope of God's salvation from uh, eternity past to eternity future. And we are a part of that plan. He says he has chosen you from the beginning. From the beginning, he has chosen you to salvation. Now... <laughs> For those who want to go a little deeper, does God choose some and reject others? The Calvinist says that God chooses certain people for salvation, and God chooses certain people to be separated from him or damned for all eternity. First of all, if, if I, if when you make that statement, what kind of God would that be? What kind of God would create 70 billion people on the earth today, and, and a majority of the, these people are probably doomed to eternal separation from God because God has made a choice to condemn them. What kind of God? Do you want anything to do with a God like that? That is not God's nature whatsoever. See, that the nature of God and the heartfelt nature of God, he, he gives us insight into Scripture. It is the fact that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is not willing that one person should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Who did Christ die? Some say that Christ only died for the elect. No, the scripture, when you get to 2 Peter chapter 2, he talks about the false teachers and Christ dying for them. Christ, when he offered himself as a sacrifice to the, for salvation and for our sins, was a plan that, that's, that, made, that encompassed all of humanity. And the heart of God is he is not willing that any should perish. And so now we look at the word chosen or election. This is like a Wednesday night Bible study. But chosen means to be elect. Okay, first of all, this really clears it up. Election is not a salvation term. Okay, once we believe, there's a process of salvation, but once we believe, not before, once we believe, we have done, received Christ as our Savior, we've asked Him to save us, 
At that point, we become the elect or the chosen. The Bible says that he has predestined us, he has chosen us before the foundation of the world. And if you stop there, you don't get the full concept of what God is speaking about. He has chosen us before the foundation of the world, not to salvation. Election and chose, choosing is not a salvation word. He has chosen us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. Then Paul says in Romans chapter 8, 28-29, uh, he says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according, called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Christ. He didn't choose them to salvation. He chose them to be conformed to the image of Christ. Election is not a salvation word. Election is a title that we receive after salvation. When you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are now the elect. You are now the chosen because you have received him as your savior. And he talks about the fact that there's a process that a person has to go through. There is the Holy Spirit working in a person's life. There is the hearing of God's word. There is the call that goes out. And when you res respond to that call, you become the chosen. That's why Paul says, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? The message has to go forth. Now here's a, an argument from logic. If God arbitrarily chose some, only some people to be saved, why is it that the most concentrated amount of people that are saved is where there is exposure to the gospel? God, if God were a just God, that means everywhere throughout the whole world, there shall be an equal amount of people among all nations, languages, tribes, whatever, that would be saved if God was doing this justly. But that's not how God saves people. He saves people in response to hearing the message of the gospel. Without the hearing of God's word, it says faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear? The appeal of Paul says, how should, how's the world going to hear unless somebody tells them? Not only somebody tells them, Jesus put the emphasis on, hey, now that you're saved, there's a good seat for you. Come to church. You don't have to do another thing from now till the time you get to eternity. No, that's not what he said. He says, go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's how people respond. That's how God puts out the call. First of all, to be saved, you've got to hear the call. The call goes out through the gospel. When a person is called, God will call you today. If you're not a believer today, God will call you. And he's called us. Remember that day when you maybe even sat in this very room and God began to work in your life and he was calling you and showing you, hey, this is the true message of God. This is what you need to do in your life. And you, by faith, responded to what you heard. You heard the call that went out through the word of God, the Holy Spirit working in your life. And guess what? You responded positively. You received the message. In receiving the message, you became a child of God. That's how God works. And that's how God will always work. And Paul tells us in this passage of scripture, that's how we become God's chosen. He says he has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. A plan has been in place from eternity past. Christ who was to be slain, or Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Peter and Revelation, John tells us that it was Christ who was slain before the foundation of the world. Before God ever made the world, he knew, he has foreknowledge, he knew what man would do. 
He knows everything the begin from the beginning of from the beginning to the end. He saw sees all of history as in one moment, and yet he knew, and in, in knowing, he had already a plan in place that Christ was slain. Christ was already put to death in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. So we see, first of all, that God worked through a plan. He has chosen us by way of a plan and our willful obedience in receiving what God has done for us. First of all, that there would be an accountability for sin. He says the wages of sin is death. He says to Adam and Eve, the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. That it would be Christ, that there would be Christ, God's only Son, who would die in our place. And that if we receive what he, had, he has done, has, uh, was done for us on the cross by faith, we would be saved. That's what John says, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The plan worked out in time. It was a plan that was worked out in time. And it would work, it would be a work of the Spirit, and it would be belief in the truth. Notice what he says in verse 13. But well, we are bound to give thanks always for you, brethren. The love of the Lord. Because God has chosen you from the beginning, or uh, from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. Jesus says to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. Peter says, being born again. Same thing, spiritual birth. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. It is God's eternal word that brings salvation to us. First uh, Timothy, or First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For our gospel came unto you, in, uh, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, it came in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Then you go to chapter 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he says, to the end, nope, that's 2.13, he says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, and ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. It's God's word that brings salvation, not only to us, but to all men. A process that God uses to bring individuals to himself. It is the Holy Spirit and the word of God would be the agents which would produce salvation. Along with God's calling and our willful response to the message of the gospel. Notice the next verse he says, Whereunto he called you. He called you. You, you are not the chosen until God calls you. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. What is the gospel? It is the good news of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It is the fact that God supplied a substitute for our sins. We deserve to die. God sent forth his only begotten son into the world to die in our place. From the very beginning of Genesis and God providing the first covering for Adam and Eve and a, a sacrifice of an animal was made, we see that the animal sacrifice was the substitute for man's sin. And so Christ is our substitute. He is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And so God has a plan. And God has loved us. 
and being a part of this plan and accepting him as our savior from eternity past. He knew that we would be here today. He knew that we would respond positively to the message. He knew that we would be a part of his family. And so God has loved us with this great love. God's love is displayed in that he has chosen you and that he has called you. I mean, I cannot, I cannot say it enough. Why me? Why me? When you look at the world around us, many people do not understand the message as the Bible puts it forth. Many people do not know Christ in a personal way. Why us? Why is it that God opened our eyes to the message of the truth of the gospel? It's an amazing thing that he has not only chosen us, but there was a point in our life that he called us as well. And every time the gospel is preached, God is calling individuals to salvation. Paul goes to Athens and he is standing there and he, they see a, a, a monument and it says to the unnamed God. Paul says, you know what, let me take a minute here and tell you who this unnamed God is. And he takes them and he tells them of Jesus and the resurrection. And so God was using Paul that day as he shared the message with the Athenians to the unknown God that they were worshiping. God was putting forth a call. It says that when they heard Paul speak, some rejected what he said, and they laughed. They mocked him. But you know what? It says that there were others there that day that not only heard, but they believed. It says certain men clave unto him and believed. He mentions three individuals by name, and he says, and there were others with them. Hey, that's what God does. You know what? You can give out the message. Some will receive it. Some will reject it. When you hear it and you receive it, the call has gone out. When you respond positively to that message, you realize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You ask Christ to save you. God called you. He saved you. Now you are the elect or the chosen. They received this salvation, Thessalonian church did. It was a salvation from sin and all its consequences, the very opposite of the doom befalling the lost at the day of Christ's return. And we've looked at that throughout this chapter. Now that did he save them, he began a work in them. He says through sanctification, a sanctification of the spirit or a sanctifying work, denotes the completed, denotes not the completed state, but the process of being detached from the world to become increasingly conformed to the character of Christ. And that's God's goal. He's using all things to what? Transform us, to change us into the image of Christ. Paul writes that as we look into the mirror, the word of God, he says we're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. What is it that God changes us? How, does, how is it that God changes us and transforms us into that image? He says, as we look into the truth of God's word. Then he talks about belief in the truth. Belief here does not mean the initial reception of that which is true, but rather the habit of faith by which one adheres to the truth. It becomes a part of our life. Paul, or John writes, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Yes, we are brought into salvation through the initial contact of faith, but our faith is now real and it's alive. And Paul and John says, this faith will give us the final victory. He says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So here we have the interaction of 
the human and the divine in salvation. Yes, there is God's part, and then there's our response. Next, we see that uh, that love is displayed in the, or, or that love is displayed in the present because God has brought them to salvation. It was displayed in the past, but that love will also be, be displayed in eternity future. Jesus' prayer to the Father was that we would someday be with him and also behold his glory. John 17, his chapter that is there, a chapter that is a prayer, he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me, first of all, that they would be with me where I am and that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. Paul writes, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. This salvation, in the, this, this salvation is grounded in a divine choice, in eternity past, initiated in the present personal experience we receive christ as our savior through the call of the gospel looks forward to a glorious culmination that you may share in the glory of our lord jesus christ glory is the splendor the honor that now belongs to the lord in his, in his exalt, as he is exalted at the right hand of God. That glory will be shared with his saints at his return. God has called them into his kingdom and glory. There's a, you know, we talk about heaven. You know what heaven is? It's the glory land. And God is awaiting for us to get there. Jesus says, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus' prayer to the Father is that all believers would be with him someday and that they would see his glory. Not only will they see his glory, they will be partakers of his glory. Paul says again, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not to be compared to the glory of that shall be revealed in us. That future day, hey, when it's all over, <laughs> no more bills, no more taxes, no more sore, sore this and sore that, arthritis and sore knees and uh, uh, aging process and sickness and difficulties, and you could go on with the list. Hey, we're looking forward to a better place. You know what it's called? It's called the glory land. That's where we're going. God has set our feet on the road that leads to the glory land. And that's where we're going to spend all eternity. With the one who loved us from eternity past. Who loves us in the present with an everlasting love. And will love us for all eternity. We cannot comprehend this great love of God. And that great love of God is demonstrated at the cross when Jesus died for our sins so that we could spend eternity with him and share in his glory. Paul says we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ. We have an inheritance waiting for us. Why? Because our willing response to the message of God's saving grace.
Maybe you're here today and God has spoken to you about your need for Christ. The Bible says that we're sinners. Because of our sin, we will be eternally separated from him. But because of his great love, he provided the sacrifice for us himself and in our, as our substitute. And all we have to do is by faith receive him as our own personal Savior. Say something like this in our hearts to God. Call upon him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize you died on the cross for me. I'm asking you today to forgive my sins and save my soul in Jesus' name.